Welcome to Make That Paper, the show where we talk about all the crazy jobs we do to make the cash we need to pursue our artistic dreams. We are your hosts, Jamie Parker Stickle. And Jason Bieber. Please welcome the brilliant Gina Frangello. And the equally brilliant Rob Roberge. I have never had, as far as the IRS is aware, a full-time job in 55 years on this planet. Now that is I, and I completely contrary to what Gina told 12. us about you. I started working for money when I was 12. I have yet yeah. to be on the books as having a full-time gig. I've had like my gig at UCR is yeah. technically half time were a campus position. So it's a 50% appointment. But it has insurance. But it has insurance. So it's legit. So it's a, the the it's government knows about me. It's a fabulous but job. But like, you know, I mean, I guess they knew about my first job legal job bagging groceries but before that i picked potatoes when i was 12 mm-hmm. he picked potatoes and also in uh, high school uh, i am interrupting you i but guess I, you I, are. but i just want to tell you guys he worked during the day and then he worked all night in no, high school. not all night night shift he I worked mean, a night shift in high school and then just went to school i worked i worked midnight to seven and went to high school because it was 1984 and, and like and, the world was insane like I, yeah where did you go to i was on, because i was on yellow jackets and i could have worked for eight weeks well, in a row. also like apparently <laughs> rob's parents thought this made sense or like i didn't uh, my there. dad my dad was out busting el chapo he wasn't worried about me yeah i grew up in michigan and you just had to get a work permit signed by the school and you could start working at 12 oh so we were all working at nine yeah we were working um, at nine but i worked for a a mobster i'm not going to give their names because they actually exist and kill people but oh my god um But give their names off. Well, record. the, fir- the first just kidding, just kidding, just he's kidding. He's dead. I do know he's dead. You don't have to give any. No, they they have. No, you do not. But have I did to give illegal names. asbestos removal for uh, a mobster who used to do what's known as buying the bids from uh, the mayor, uh, corrupt mayor of Bridgeport, Connecticut. Real quick, are there air quotes around asbestos? They no. are not, and there no. are okay. there are sadly not air quotes around mesothemioma either. So I have. I know. I I so. that's the jury I was on mesothemioma. Yeah. It's serious yeah, shit, but it's it's in the past so it's happened we would liquefy it and dump it into the long island sound oh god damn it an underwater fire the corrupt mayor was was known was his name was mandanisi the underwater fire in the long island sound that we partially caused with chemical toxins liquefied asbestos was known as mandanisi mountain you couldn't see the flames but you saw the blue fish dead on the shore no no the river was the the tire fire this is the long island sound A lot of water burned around. Potato, potato. potato. <laughs> it shows up in Rob's song lyrics, and the river uh, is on fire. But uh, <laughs> uh, oh my god, Ohio had nothing on us. But then the Army Corps of Engineers came in, and they decided the only thing that could put out this fire that I partially caused working for this mobster. Now I don't take blame because I, I was a, I was a cog in. You're a kid. I, you were working yeah. there, and you were a kid. And, you didn't uh, know. And the Army Corps of Engineers, the only thing that will put this out is far worse than this toxic fire could ever dream of being. So we're going to let it burn off. And sure. uh, about eight years after I finished college, the fire that, that I had start, helped start stopped burning in the Long Island Sound and the bluefish. Mm-hmm. Well, they still show up dead on the shore, but it's probably another reason. I, I just want to say also <laughs> that, like, Rob lives in a super, super weird town. They they had a, um, a smoking section in front of the school. They had no driver's ed. You just got a license. And they took the kids for a field trip no, they, to, they had to see I a, a toaster have an exorcism. That Okay, no, high school... It's like he grew up in the 50s. No, high, I feel yeah. like, what's happening? Well, except for all the weird murders. but There were a lot of murders. Um, is this in Long Island? This is a no, part of Long. No, this is Monroe, Connecticut. It's about equidistant between Bridgeport, Connecticut, and Danbury, Connecticut. It's the weirdest uh, freaking town. But in the world. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it had its things. And they they have a house in Twenty Nine Palms, and they're saying this is the weirdest freaking. Oh, town. oh my no, god! No, no, no. no, Monroe's not as weird oh as. Oh my Wonder god, Valley. you guys! The the desert <laughs> is so weird. From like whether it's Bombay Beach or like Wonder Valley. I want to get my old boss to come out Holy and start cracking smoke. skulls. It's, it's, it, 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 it is surreally freaking odd out there. I mean, we had a plane crash in our yard. Like that was it, wild. It, it just and that's the least of it. But actually. they wouldn't like, let us keep it. It, it, 
Uh, yeah, like, finders keepers. That's like the, keepers. It's the greatest. I mean, everyone like has like an old house. truck in their yard and stuff. That's the yep. greatest desert yard art is a flipped plate. Everyone lived, so I'm not being glib. Rob's everyone like, walked right, right. away. I right. want that rusted plane upside down in our yard. I think. Well, you know what? You you may not get you. They may not let you keep it, but you don't have to let them onto your property to retrieve it. They weren't even yeah, there. Yeah, see, they that's the like, thing. Oh, they weren't there. there. Yeah. yeah. If you had been there, they wouldn't even have tried. They would have been like scared. That's a good point. <laughs> yep. Well, it would not have been unusual if like it nope. weren't us for us to be out there with like our guns because <laughs> we're part of a militia, because that's like a significant yep. contingent of the population out in yep. the sure. woods, yep. you know. Yep. Except, like, except they're nonconformists or they hate militia. They're just all individual lunatics. That's true. Right. That's true. <laughs> right. Yes. The it's, right to form a lunatic. I I can't I can't support big militia. <laughs> <laughs> i'm an american <laughs> i i gotta say um it, it's interesting how much we can all love the desert and um how how um well, how well you'll do airbnb and being there as as artists and having that as an income like you'll do very very well but it's amazing to me because the population out there is so anti the people that go visit the area and anti some of the people that buy there as vacation homes it's it's such a um it's such a unique part of a american culture a small fraction i think that's growing but still um yeah it, it freaks it, me out a lot I'm, of that little, is um is really also like sort of even more amplified in the bombay beach community which we've been involved with as you know right and mm -hmm. yeah. you know where there were where there are only something like 235 original residents and then the artist cool community has kind of come in and and has sunk a lot of money into the town i mean they're not just like coming traipsing or like they've put a lot of money into the town um but you know also started airbnbs more population more people coming to visit and kind of loiter around and and there's really a love-hate relationship yeah. like where some of the original community is kind of like wow this is amazing this town was it's on a dying toxic sea the population is largely elderly like they they're, that they're river was burned out town. and then other people are like who the hell are these people get out of here with your you know right. weird art shit and, and some like, kids just going to be happy there's maggots to shovel <laughs> the, whole, the whole town of real circle there are no kids in the baby beach <laughs> not no not many there, not really. there, there were in the 90s but there, there are not now that's true mm -hmm. jesus I, nothing grosses me out more than maggots i had to i went to um uh, you know crime writers camp last oh, yeah. summer oh, yeah. the thing yeah. that. The, in milwaukee yeah. or wherever in the midwest yeah but this year they had it the year i went they had it at the fbi at searchy it was the year before COVID. Was Todd there with you? No, Todd didn't go that year, but I got sponsored through UCR. Okay. But you know, Oliver, Oliver from the program went with me. Oh, Oliver Brennan and I went. Will. Yeah, Brennan. And um, he's my buddy. And so Great Oliver guy. and I went, and I swear to God, I have never seen more maggots in my life. All they wanted to do was show us how fast bodies decompose with maggots. And it was <laughs> like maggot after maggot. And I thought, you know what? If I never see another maggot again, I'll be fine because the first time I saw maggots, I couldn't eat spaghetti ever again. I still don't eat spaghetti. Like maggots are the most disgusting. No, the worst thing is the speed of the gas pressure in decomp is the worst it's, thing. It's. <laughs> I used to it's, live in a house. And sorry, oh. I didn't go to the camp to find. <laughs> Jamie, I used to live in a house full of maggots. Um, so it this was is the maggot house. It was the maggot house. Was what my roommate Robin and I called it. Um, oh my house. god! And um, and so there was this decaying fruit tree in front of the apartment, and we were both. So uh, I, we were both graduate. The uh, she was an undergraduate at Dartmouth, and I was a graduate student. And um. And we were broke, you know, we had no money. And so we're, we shared it with this third person named Erica who ran up about a, a bunch of 900 bills and then disappeared. And then a guy named Neil you mean moved the in too. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah. And and then this guy named Neil moved in. But I don't really remember either then that, well, Robin was a good friend of mine. But anyway, every morning there would be a new influx of maggots all over our kitchen ceiling. And you know, this was just my job. And, I didn't um, live like this. And so Robin's <laughs> boyfriend at the time and my boyfriend at the time 
would have to come over because Robin and I, of course, would be like, ah! Like, and so they would come over and they would scrape the maggots with like plastic or regular knives, like on the paper plates and like fold them up and dispose of them out in a, you know, and this was just like daily life, daily life, wake up to the maggots. So it was, it was truly disgusting. I've lived some disgusting places, but that place. I've lived, that was disgusting. I've lived in more disgusting places than that, but I also owned a chainsaw for the rotting trees that leaned on the roof that would leave maggots on the ceiling. I didn't own the property, nor did I own a chainsaw. You not you right, right. own. <laughs> but yeah, that's, um, I will never own a we, chainsaw. We, 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 we own a chainsaw. Oh my god, don't tell me. For winter break and like the pipes burst and the whole apartment like froze and we just like <laughs> fled. We just were like no and then just like yeah. Oh. See, this is like I would do the New same. England is worse. Than, like we talk about the desert, and yeah, there's lunatics, and your your plumber is a meth head who doesn't know how to hook up the sink to the toilet and various things. And you know, you turn on the shower, and shit flows out of your sink. But but it's better than rural New England because that maggot oh story God. that's like yep. every corner in New Hampshire. R- rural and the most Republican on top. Rural of New England is a weird <laughs> place. So I come from, of course, inner city Chicago, and when I you know I wanted to go into the mental health professions and help women and so forth and like and I'd grown up in this inner city you know poverty ridden neighborhood where like I lived across the street from mobsters and there were gangs and a lot a lot a lot of murders and so forth um you know one of my own cousins got killed in that neighborhood but a lot of people that I went to school with and and you know and I think like oh I'm ro- moving to the idyllic world <laughs> right right I would think so like, too this is everyone here is gonna be like so clean cut and amazing and it's like they all have a gun collection and are pistol whipping their wives you have to take everyone for a restraining order like it's it's madness like I had you know clients whose parents kept animals and would like make them kill their pets if they misbehaved I mean it was just it was insanity out there so I mean that was my when I grew up, my father was always saying, because my mom would make a lot of noise about wanting to move out of the neighborhood. And my father would always say, like, oh, Jesus Christ, honey, like, every place is the same. You think you're going to go somewhere different than this. It's, every, it's the same everywhere. And I would always be like, what is wrong with him? Like, I read books and watch television, and I see that not every place is like this. But when I went out it there, is. I finally kind of really got what he meant, because it's like, not every place is exactly the same, but there is that element, no matter where you go, mm-hmm. no matter what the economic strata. Oh, it all just has yeah. To, it all just has to do with how much it's hidden. And as I, long listen, as there are humans there. Listen, we're in Los Angeles. Right. We're in a, a nice area of Los Angeles for the schools because our kid goes to public school. And still I pick him up and there are pickup trucks with the flag in the back that looks, you know, oh, sure. it's not the Confederate flag, it's the American flag, but you know how the Confederate flag There's used to be on the trucks. Now. It's the same <laughs> thing now. It's the, thank you, that's my point. It's the same thing. And I freak out and I start like, I just want to get him from science class. I just want to, where are you coming from? Why are you here? Mm-hmm. This is LA, man. But you know, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's weird though. I think, you know, like getting back to the gigs and the, 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 the yeah. geography, the weirdness for me, like the greatest thing about, I always thought every job existed to show me what I didn't want to do for the rest of my life if yeah. I wasn't successful in killing myself before 30, which was my goal at the time. Oh, um, my God. You know, Lofty. In, in, case Lofty. I had to, in case I had to live on this liver for a few retreads, I had to make sure what right. I could do to make money. And But I am really lucky that every gig I ever had, like someone else had that maggot shoveling gig, but they didn't have the guy who slept with his cousin. Like, yes. I have something in my DNA that I am so gifted that I am a freak magnet that if I'm if I go to the store magnet. for a, a, a pint of half and half, some guy is going to come up to me in the alley because I always walk the alley instead of the road. So this is probably one of the reasons. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna gonna say, like, this is not your DNA. He's He's like, like, hey, man, I got a great lazy Susan I can sell you. And and like to me, that's or maybe some fetal pigs. Someone did try to sell me yeah. fetal pigs. And of course, that ended up in a book. But I'm just really lucky that yeah, every job, freak every job I get, even if it's like when I was temping at a bank, they put me in the basement with the guy who wants to sell fetal pigs. I never get seated next to the person who says, oh, this is my niece. She's going to Harvard. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. it's great. And now a word from our sponsor. 
You know what I bet our listeners are thinking right now? What's that, Bieber? They're probably thinking, this podcast thing is so easy. I could start my own podcast. And you know what? They're right. Yeah, we've been using Anchor for a few months now, and it has totally changed our game. Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free! I said, let me explain. Fine. There are creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. And Anchor will distribute your podcast for you, so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and pretty much anywhere podcasts are streamed. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. I mean, it's everything you need to make a podcast, all in one place. And it's free! Yes. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. And now, back to the podcast. So, like, all those jobs, as terrible as they were, um, you know, I had I, one of my painting gigs, our boss lost the entire payroll on the Kentucky Derby. And we, oh, said, Jesus. And we said, Fletch. And he said, it was a sure thing. And I'm like, well, I'm glad, it, <laughs> glad it was a sure thing or else we'd be shit out of luck for two weeks. And, you know, and like, you know, we had, but he also lived in Florida. So we're not, even, <laughs> we're not even into Florida, which obviously, you know, like, do you know anything about sports? sports? There, there's a really obnoxious, like color commentary guy named Dick Vitale, who used to. Be oh, sure. I know Dick Vitale. Dick Vitale. I used, I worked at this tourist trap bar in, in Sarasota on Turtle Bay. And Turtle Dick, Bay, baby. <laughs> Dick Vitale. Sounds like- and Brian Johnson, the lead singer of ACDC, were best friends. Oh, God. And both are enormously loud men. And that was probably <laughs> the best part of that job, other than all the free cocaine. Um, but Dick Vitale. Did they pay you in Brian cocaine? Johnson, like, Dick Vitale's from Detroit, and he'd go, oh, baby. And Brian Johnson's like, oh, I love you. It was a beautiful show. <laughs> That's Great. Amazing. I love serving them drinks. That's amazing. <laughs> that was the least weird thing that ever happened in Florida. Like, <laughs> That's of a great course. title. And other stories. <laughs> yeah. And others. Okay. I better see that coming up. I, I want to see one of those publishers thing where they announce announce the next book. I should then... just be in the about the author and just say it should also just say he also lived in Florida. So he you also, know. yeah. Yeah. You know. So, you I know. am gonna put that um, on there. I think you should. Don't judge. I think you should. And and I will send you a transcript of this so you remember. Um were you in Florida or lower Alabama? Uh, both for a while, little little Jacksonville, uh, but uh, the key marathon key and mm. Sarasota for the majority. Oh, Sarasota, I think that's where um, Brian, no, um, Bennett is from. Oh, god, oh, god, no, um, from so, the New York, yeah. <laughs> We had a we had, we had a we had a brief uh, flinging fantasy about uh, getting something at place in the Keys. We did. We talked about it. No, just for a vacation. Well, with the idea of you know. Oh, another Airbnb, not actually living there, but we were like, yeah. oh, the Keys, well, because what? Be what sh- it used to be incredible down there. I've but they had the hurricane, and a lot of the homes were just taken out. It was like well, five years ago. A lot of hurricanes. Yeah. Yeah, there are going to be more. I mean, yeah. they used to be yeah. once every Not forty years. Yeah. You had the nineteen twenty eight one, and then you didn't have one for fifty years, and right. now they're coming every three months. Mm-hmm. It's cr- what's. <laughs> yeah. We know what's going but on. There's no yeah. reason. summer is now hurricane season. <laughs> But, you know, I, I just want to re- go back for one second because Rob said, no, Rob, you said that you are a freak magnet, but Jason often refers to me as the mentally ill magnet. Like, if the person's well, mentally you are ill. Me. I mean, well, listen, I got papers. And thank you for being here. And thank you for being here. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's a little abs- absurd, but I think, like, we do attract the things that we have knowledge of. Like, I think our energy is open to that, which we've already experienced. Right. So growing up in a certain way with certain people around me, very good me correction, I, I think you just said the quiet part kind of quietly loud. Kind of quietly <laughs> loudly. Um, it, 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 you have an open energy to it. So like you sniff that shit out and it sniffs you out and you're all of a sudden you're like, wow, I'm going to have to write about you. And I hope that nobody, you know, what was it? The kidney story? Nobody kidney stories me or cat lady stories me, but you're going to be in a book for God's Uh, sake. I can't even. We can't. We're not going to talk about it here. But anybody who knows, knows what that means. And that's enough. Mm -hmm. Look it up. Just just Google kidney story. So anyways, but the point is like, I think as you know, yes, all of us have worked these gig jobs and these things to survive and these things that also, I think as writers and as artists, there's a little bit of us that's like, 
oh, I want to see where this job's going to go. Oh, I'm really interested in this. Oh, I'm not walking away until I get more information. I'm here. always willing to walk away. <laughs> That's nice. I'm not. I, I have to stay until Jason's like, no, you really need to pull yourself out of this, Jamie. Walk away. Because I am committed to finding the end of the tunnel. Um, but I, I do think it's interesting. And I, I do think- like, I, I appreciate that you call it the end of the tunnel and not the light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> no, there's no light. <laughs> There's no light. It's a dead end. It's always a dead end. It's the bottom of the tunnel. It's the writing where you find your your light. And you at. realize it wasn't a tunnel. It was a well. Okay. But what I but <laughs> what I really want to do coyotes is coyotes tunnel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's nothing. I'm always banging my head on the back of it. Um. Oh, you, you want to say something? Well, I just well we're, we we uh, we're coming kind of towards the end. Towards of, the end, yeah. Yeah, and I and I wanted to ask a question of both of you before before getting away from from it is each of you have had so many incredible jobs yeah um and both of you have incorporated your experiences from those jobs into your writing which for this question is for for each of you one at a time uh which job what what experience from which job stood out the most as the thing that really either played a specific part or or an overall influence in your creative uh expression in your writing and and, and everything else uh, i'll answer gina first yeah I, I have a job um when i worked at the latchmere pub in london um while living in a place called arthog house that was kind of one step above a squat i had squatted some the year before but this place actually had a a guy named mr d with hairy ears who would come around and collect the rent and i lived in this place it was me one australian woman named jude and um about 11 men from all over the world and that job at the latchmere pub and then that actual place arthog house and and some of the people who lived in it has made the most direct translation into my work because um, there's a chapter um, in the House of Reinvention in my novel, A Life in Men, in which Arthog House and the Latchmere Pub, and even one of the characters from the real place who, um, who had been a uh, an Olympic hopeful in South Africa, but South Africa was banned from the Olympics. So he came to England to find a British girl to marry him so he could compete for England, but instead ended up um, in the circus doing the trapeze. And- You should book him. And, um, <laughs> and I woke up one morning, he's on the, the pay phone in our hallway, mom, dad, I'm joining the circus. And, um, <laughs> and then there was also a guy named, uh, a guy there whose nickname was Yank, who has appeared in, in quite a few of my, my fictional pieces, you know, a different version of him, obviously, and not his real name, but his nickname. But that place, um, that place really occupied a, a major part of my creative imagination. I think just because we used to call the flat the United Nations. It was it was just all these people from all over the world who were, I guess, seeking, but also down on their luck and just kind of converged and formed this very tight knit family. Like we were a family. We took care yeah. of each other. And um and I I don't know why that over so many other things mm -hmm. stood out to me but i guess you know i was 22 years old and i had grown up in the house my father was born in in a neighborhood where no one ever left and just i think also i had always thought that to travel and to get out of my neighborhood was going to be equated with some sort of economic um step up but yeah. we were all impoverished, ob obviously, in this place. And, you know, I mean, some of the guys were like dealing drugs or working as laborers as at construction sites. And I was a bartender. And, you know, like we all were just very, you know, moment to moment and just kind of collectively trying to take care of each other. And it, and it really opened my eyes, I think, to, um, you know, just to a lot of things, both economically and in terms of the characters of what we might assume about certain types of men 
which was not my experience then with those men, which was very different from my experiences with the men in my neighborhood. Um, you know, yeah. I, I found this group of guys who, who, you know, would get stared at on the, on the tube or, you know, when we go into a bookstore, someone would follow us around to make sure they weren't stealing anything. But like, to <laughs> me, they were the people who were like covering my rent and cooking me dinner every night, you know, and, and that had just been really different from my experiences growing up where I had equated, I think, um, a, a lot of men with simply being predatory. And I had made erroneous mm -hmm. assumptions about that being somewhat class yeah. um, related. Yeah. And, and thinking getting out and meeting different kinds of people had to do with having to elevate myself economically. And, and of course, obviously, you know, you don't want to necessarily live hand to mouth reliant on, you know, 11 people from other countries eating right. frozen vegetables for dinner every night. But that being said, it taught me a lot about like the tenderness that a, a a kind of man was capable of that I had not been aware of. And, and my dad was a really tender guy, but I thought he was sort of like the, the anomaly, like the only one out there. Um, and that I had to, I had to, you know, I had to go into a completely different realm if I wanted to break out of that. So anyway, that really made a big impact on my fiction. And I think on, on just me. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That makes sense. I, it's beautiful same rob same, same question i really think it was it was my gigs probably from about 22 to 26 um working in both residential and industrial painting for mm -hmm. mobsters and mm -hmm. my town had a lot of mob it's it's funny we're from incredibly different places but we're both from mob towns full of mur weird murders yeah. um and a couple other things that are really similar yeah. but one of the things I absolutely loved about uh, my friend's dads and the guys who were both mobbed up, and then there were the guys who worked for the mob and drove bread trucks and did little drop-offs and things like that, but they were all kind of of a world, and they told great stories, and they had great nicknames, and there was danger. And I responded really well to those three things that affected my writing career in a tremendous way. It's like there was a guy named Jimmy Tenentu. Jimmy Tenentu was named Jimmy Tenentu because his feet were at 10 and 2 o'clock when he walked. <laughs> My family didn't do shit like that. I loved that, you know? Like, yeah. You know, the, 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 there, there was Big Doug and Little Doug, and you were an idiot if you, you were an idiot if you listen to Little Doug. Big Doug knew stuff, but you listen to, like Doug told me, it's like, who told you? Little Doug, what are you, a fucking idiot? You know, so there was this natural, what my mentor and, and later, and one of my best friends later called, uh, fuck me, no fuck you dialogue, which I just grew up with and became a natural rhythm to the way I think about human speech. And then there were stories like, I was painting with this buddy of mine named Mike, we were both guitar players, we'd go see Richard Thompson and try to figure out a solo acoustic finger stylings, and then we'd go paint for this mobster and do asbestos removal for him. And my buddy, Mike, we were 24 years old, had dated this mobster's new fiance who was already. Oh God. And he was like 55 or 40. Oh God. And you know, huge, ugly man. And I mean, ear here was mentioned as a bad thing. And unfortunately now I'm old enough that the, <laughs> I'm the guy with the ear here. Someone's gonna tell the story oh on a podcast God. or whatever the equivalent is in 30 years. Well, that ear hair professor I had. <laughs> But, but uh, so, th so this guy, and I, God, I wish I could say his name. Um, but, uh, oh, screw it. He's like, oh, dude, you're not. Okay. You're not. Okay. That's anyway, well, let's just call he him comes up, He comes Joe. up and he says, Michael, I know about you and Jenny. What's past is past. But if I ever see you look at her, her so much as the wrong way, I'm going to smash your head with a ball peen hammer. And my buddy Mike, he walks away and we're at lunch. And Mike says, what the hell is the wrong way? I quit. I'm gone. I'm out of here. It's like, I don't know what the wrong way to look at her is. A ball peen hammer. So Mike was gone at the end of lunch. And that kind of work, working for those guys, scared me, gave me a, a reinforcement of my fear of male authority, which is a dominant thing throughout my work. Um, wow. Colorful language, great stories, pe people on the margins of society who will work mm -hmm. harder to get a buck illegally than it would 
would be they could work 10 times easier to make a legal buck but it's no there's no hustle there i loved those guys and they just the whole notion that you would work 10 times harder to screw the man who didn't give a shit about you to begin with that if you worked at like off track betting you would have been legal and still sleazy and you would have made money you know totally so i think that you know, a ton of jobs did it. Um, obviously, having to be nice to people in the service industry when I, I didn't think that just the exchange, a monetary exchange earned them being nice unless they were nice, you know. So I, I wasn't good mm -hmm. at that stuff. But I do think that job with nicknames, stories, fear. Also, I was a very active drug addict and drunk at the time, and I had to struggle. I was a good worker. I didn't miss days. I wasn't late. I had to get off a scaffold or puke off a scaffold four times a morning, look out below, but I did my job and it, it really trained me that, that life could be really hard and you had to put it in and get shit done. And sometimes how you felt didn't matter, but it wasn't like some ethical thing. It's like, I needed drug money. It wasn't, I was eating government cheese. It wasn't like I was, you know, getting money to <laughs> do good things. We'll be right back. Let's get back to the show. But I think that job did everything I needed. Like, like it gave me all the skills that later applied to less bad employment or equally bad employment that was probably less colorful in a way. But also never forgetting for a second, those guys killed people. Those guys raped people. Those guys hired people who were gang rapists. I mean- They get drugs into, you know, neighborhoods of well, color I, on purpose. I wasn't thinking yeah, about the I mean, uh, the ethics of where drugs were distributed you know, at the yeah. time. No, I mean, it, but it's true. But no it, one can tell yeah. a story like a mobbed up guy. God, are they funny yeah, and sad so, but true. So I think that, that job, be, probably because of the narratives and the characters yeah, and the danger. It taught me a lot about stakes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you could only write those stories fiction because <laughs> if you write stuff nonfiction that is true that, to that extent, sometimes people are like, that's not true. Well, that doesn't in happen. Memoir, and the legal people that's at true. Crown slash uh, Random House were like, are they alive? And that was with, I can say this because they're not going to sue and they're not killers. I lived with two guys named oh, Ron and John Grimm in, in McKinleyville, California. The Brothers Grimm. The Brothers Grimm. And they were legally, That's crazy. legally blind. Their best friend was a meth dealer. I was trying to quit drugs. It, it was a hilarious, insane house. And I put the Brothers Grimm in the memoir and the legal person's like you can't do that and i'm like no, but there crazy. is no other like it's not like they're the, the, brothers the dark him. brothers you know like yeah right you're taking away the whole thing and then i realized well is it really that good a section if it's entirely reliant on their name <laughs> i do want to say like just though the, i'm sorry I went the, on too long. no no god um but like that whole idea of how people will work ninety thousand times harder to do something outside the law or the establishment than they would necessarily have to to make the same amount of money with a proper job like is it is a fascinating mentality when i was living at our thug house we had a guy there named roger who i you know he could have been anywhere between 40 and 60 the rest most of us were like 21 22 years old um he was british he had three different birth certificates he wasn't <laughs> sure which one was the right one and um and uh, he had grown up in like group homes and he had a really um. complex story a, real, a lot of short-term memory issues but um, but he and the and the Yank guy and I had this thing where and and I don't remember whether Roger or, or Yank had made it up, but they'd wrap coins. This isn't a life in men. They would wrap like British coins so that they would weigh the same exact amount. We had a scale as much as a coin worth more money. And then we would go from tube stop to tube stop to tube stop all day. And we'd put these coins in and we'd press return and we'd get back our actual, you know, like the, the higher value money. You'd put in a penny and you'd get back a quarter. Right, right, essentially British. Okay? In, in British, and like, in British and if currency. if you did this long enough, you know, you might make 50 pounds in a day, you know, wow. you went to enough places. But 
sitting there wrapping these coins and then you know you couldn't stick around any one tube station too long because <laughs> obviously then people would be like what the hell's going on over there like and they like to bring me because i looked innocent you know uh -huh. and so like it, it was a, a big running joke because i would wear you know like a, a skirt because i'm a skirt girl and so they'd be like oh no one will think she's she's doing it you know so they they bring me along but it was like the amount of labor we put into that, like, dude, you could have a bartending job too, you know, like, mm -hmm. and, and make probably maybe not quite as much money, but you'd spend a lot less time. My job was a lot less labor <laughs> than, that, than that job, you know? So that yeah. was really interesting. And I think like it, both Rob and I, it is interesting because he grew up much more middle class and, and in a small town. And I grew up inner city, like super hardcore inner city, you know, in poverty, but we both grew up around a lot of outlaws, a lot of Italian outlaws, and yeah. and well, seeing I, that, I, like, I, I mean, we we had Jewish and Polish outlaws too. We did not have sure. Jewish or Polish the, people. The Polish mob, <laughs> the Polish mob is much more. They, they, you don't you don't sit around a uh, the gentleman's club talking stories with the Polish mob. Do, 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 they, do they cook? They do not let you in. It's a closed community. The old Italian man, the, mob, the yeah. old Jewish man, yeah. they let you in and you to tell cook. you stories. And you and you have to make uh, food at I the have, men's club. I have, in fact, at a friend's uh, father's insistence, sliced garlic with a razor blade. Huh. My dad went to a men's club for so many years, and it was basically like that Goodfellas scene where everybody's like making yeah. all the sausage it, and the pot. Like yeah. that was just, but not in prison. No, not in prison. <laughs> not, my father With was never in prison. Cups. <laughs> he was one of the only people there who'd never been in prison, but he had never been in prison. <laughs> You know, it's so funny. I dated a New York Italian once and like his family, they were coming off well right now. <laughs> no, no, no. They're <laughs> fine. They're fine. His family was not mafia, but all the extended family was. And so they wouldn't refer to anybody by their first name when I'd go to visit. They lived in Long Island. Um, and Our friend in Yonkers. <laughs> yes, exactly. Our, our cousin in Yonkers. God, I hate And they had like certain swear words they'd use about him, which meant the level of mob oh, they were in you know like were. that fucker or that asshole yep. or that cunt you know like it was man this whole episode was clean until right now sorry about that <laughs> but i would just sit there listening like uh-huh i'm from michigan lots of polish lots of jewish lots of yet yeah, no none of that lots of KLD, and i don't think there's any mob in where i'm from in detroit You're anymore they were all buried and now they're dead you know it was just a really funny always a mob. i said there's they're an amish mob buried and dead you know, um, I, anyway. I just wanted to um and maybe this is a, a a button for the whole thing but i really <laughs> wanted to to point out that as we now you know all of us now live in this gig economy and and work in it and cobble things together and in many ways the same could be said we could get probably all of us get regular jobs too. yeah Oh, but we're, our, we're all we're all we're all capable, qualified, educated corporate jobs, enough. middle yeah. management. Yeah. We could get yeah. regular Full jobs, benefits. make plenty of more, probably make more money oh, and live yeah. more comfortable lives. Yeah. Bigger houses. Well, except yeah. working nine to five isn't that comfortable. But I well, that's the thing. That. Well, no, that's exactly that's the thing. Like it, we're, you know, <laughs> we're not, I mean, we're not look, sticking it to the man. I work as many hours, too, but I'm not on the freeway. Yeah, that's true. I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, yeah. Jason. We're still, no, no. Sorry. That, I mean, you're 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 making the same point, which is that we're not. Well, we're not trying to stick it to the man in a sense of like I'm not living within the system, but right. you know, in many ways, we are. Where it's it's a it's, denial of. So basically, you're saying that artists are outlaws. And ladies and gentlemen, the title of the next book. The title of artists are outlaws. Let's write that down. We we'll write it together, all four of us. It'll I, be a collective. I think we mm -hmm. like to do things um, on our own. You know, yeah. like yep. artists like to do things where we are as much possible, you know, our own boss, make our own yep. schedule. You know, it's easier to manage five different jobs with overlapping deadlines when they're all more self-motivated and you can do them at flexible hours, often from your own home. It's yeah. just a certain mentality, you know, that. I think is is common to creative people. Like we just don't do well, like in in a cubicle. You know, it's not mm -hmm. it's not 
Right. We're not going to, uh, you know. Well, there's I, the hours too. Like I worked at a copy cop in Boston, which is very much like a Kinko's. And it was known as the gig you could get because the, the place and the managers were sensitive to actors and musicians being on tour and actors, uh, you know, um, auditioning audition schedule, which of course you have to do 30 of them to get a gig after being told you're too short, too tall, too whatever, to your face. Too ugly. <laughs> yeah. Too, um, we can't, we can't sell you as pretty. The funny other thing that we shared we is Copy Cop was right next to a Planned Parenthood and had the people who wanted us to make copies of their you know, garbage cans full of fetuses and stuff. But we also were called in with bomb threats nearly every weekend. So it's funny because we worked at a totally different place and ended up on the si uh, sidewalk across from people picketing every, every Sunday morning at sea. Didn't you guys refuse to make those comments? Yeah, we were we yeah. were allowed to refuse, our manager yeah. allowed. But it was, uh, yeah, it was very strange. It, but Copy Cop was a gig that, you know, I worked with people from Mission of Burma. I worked with people from the neighborhoods and Galaxy 500 worked at, people from Galaxy worked at the Cambridge one and all the actors. And I think we've always found gigs that allowed us to do the great thing we're lucky to do, which is create yep. something out of nothing, no matter what the art form is. Right. Is yeah. yep. people don't get as adults to live in a sanctioned play space the way children need to have and i think adults need to have it too and we work around the way people make money to make our money so that we can have that space i think well said yeah well said i i'm gonna say on that note <laughs> yeah I, like you you rap i feel like rob and gina did our job for us on this very, episode. Very, 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 they, good job you guys well Thank well so podcasted hard. listeners yeah we're gonna go on a little vacation rob and gina will be filling in for us for the next couple of weeks <laughs> I'll try and let you guys know who's up next. Please join us next week for the continuation of our conversation with Gina Frangello and Rob Roberge. Um, we just want to thank you guys so much. We know how busy you are. You guys hustle. You work so hard. You're stars. I'm I'm very appreciative of you. I want to thank you so, so, so much. Yeah, this has thank been you. a really great talking to you. I've, I've heard about both of you so much. She's so Such a pleasure. Thank you, thank you guys. We found a man